thank you so much for, uh, for being with us this afternoon as we celebrate Women History Month. I want to welcome you uh, yeah, just with joy as we have a series of events happening this month. It really provides us a, a special opportunity to reflect uh, upon and honor the incredible contributions and achievement of women uh, throughout the history and uh, also acknowledging the remarkable women in our own campus, especially our students, faculty, and staff that are here today. Let's give them a round of applause, all of you. You know, in our, our dynamic uh, academic community, we're privileged to have an array of talented, inspiring, and brave women, uh, faculty, staff, students, alumni, who contribute to the rich tapestry of our campus and share their stories of triumph, resilience, and they lead by example, as you'll hear today. We're gathered uh, in this space, and I'm reminded of the women who have served as mentors, even for myself, and my grandmother, my mother, and other countless uh, trailblazers who have paved the way for progress, breaking barriers, right, and challenging the societal norms. Uh, today's uh, town hall, repairing the past, achieving social justice, and perilous times by our esteemed one and only Dr. Francis Berry is really a call to recognize the power of each voice, particularly those historically marginalized or underrepresented. And as Dr. Berry explains in history, teaches us to resist, each generation must make its own dent in the wall of injustice uh, for the change that we seek to see. So as such, we must speak boldly uh, for those who can't speak for themselves and take action uh, when necessary. Um, let this town hall not just be a gathering, uh, but a, really a platform for reflection, for inspiration, and a renewed commitment. Let's create an environment where every individual, regardless of gender, feels valued, respected, empowered uh, to reach their full potential. This is not just our goal, it's all of our responsibility. So thank you again for joining us today in this celebration. Let me now invite uh, Dr. Natalina Montero, Professor Montero, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you so much again for being here. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, some of you guys are awake. Okay, so very quickly. Um, <laughs> doc, are we, every time, do you awake? Dr. Mary Frances Berry, uh, an author, activist, educator, and historian. For more than 40 decades, Dr. Mary Frances Berry has been one of the most visible and respected activists in the cause of civil rights, gender equity, and social justice. Serving as the chairperson of the US Civil Rights Commission, Dr. Berry led the charge for equal rights and liberties for all Americans over the course of four presidential administration. A, a trailblazer for women and African American alike, she also became the first woman of any race to head a major research university as a chancellor of the University of Colorado at Boulder. She is a Geraldine R. Sagal professional professor of American social thought and professor of history at the University of Pennsylvania, where she teaches the history of American law, and the history of law and social policy. Dr. Berry made history as one of the founders and momentable free, free South African movement, which is FSAM. She received the Nelson Mandela Award from the South African government for her role in organizing the FSAM, raising global awareness of of, so, of South Africa injustice and helped to end almost 40 years of apartheid in South Africa. She, she also has served as, a, as Assistant Secretary for Education in the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, working to make those historical inequitable systems achieve a new level of fairness. A prolific writer and author, Dr. Berry's books cover a wide range of subjects 
from the history of constitutional racism in America to the history of progressive activism. Her latest book, History Teaches to Resist How Progressive Movements Have Succeeded in Challenging Times, examined the, the successful tactics of movement that ended the Vietnam War, jumpstart the, governmental, the government response to AIDS, a pandemic, championed the Americans with Disability Act, and advanced civil, women's, and LGBTQ rights for which she, has, she was part of. Her previous book, Power in Words, the story behind Barack Obama's speech from the State House to the White House offers insight and historical context of President Obama's most memorable speeches. A moving speaker who makes history come alive Dr. Barry believes that each generation has the responsibility to make a dent in the wall of injustice. She continues to speak boldly for those who cannot speak for themselves and motivate all of us to take action. Her clarion challenge called for everyone to stand up, stand tall, and never give up the fight. Uh, some topics that she has spoken before, and you can see some of the books on, on the screen, so I'm not going to repeat them. But um, one of my favorites, of course, is Repairing the Past and Confronting the Legacy of Slavery. It was my favorite until the recent book, uh, History Teaches to Resist. So uh, without further ado, I want you guys to stand up and give her a welcome, ELAC welcome to Dr. Uh, Mary Frances Berry. Thank you. Thank you very much. I told Natalie that she's amazing. Um, that was an amazing introduction. Let me just say that um, when I was thinking about the title uh, that I gave for what I would talk about after I saw what the people here who did such a marvelous job of putting it together thought I should talk about, I have this Thing about repairing in perilous times. And this morning I was thinking that all times are perilous for people <laughs> who are people who have been locked out and who have been uh, struggling to gain equality through generations. And so it's not that any particular time, you know, the media may say that this time is like there's never been another time like this, or something like that, but that's not true. We have had struggles, and I have, some of you have, maybe all of you, and your ancestors uh, throughout my whole family's life, and we continue to struggle. Let me just say that um, you always have to say when you make talks like this that the United States has made tremendous project, pros, uh, progress because if you don't, people always ask me when I go places or afterwards, reporters ask me somewhere, how come I said that everything was crummy in the United States and we weren't doing anything right and all of that? And didn't we do some good things? So I'll say, we made some progress in terms of trying to improve the lives of poor people and for brown and black people, Asian Americans, people with disabilities, women in general, transgenders, LBGTQ plus people, and all of what I call, I identify all of us, when we're sitting around talking in the civil rights movement and we're having discussions about what we're gonna do for everybody, we call ourselves the food groups. <laughs> we say, okay, so what are, we, what are we food groups gonna do right now? So let me just say that I was told that I was to talk about social justice, human rights, gender uh, equality, reparations, et cetera. It is Women's History Month, as your president said. Today, I think it's Equal Pay Day, but good luck with that. We haven't gotten that yet. That's among the things we haven't gotten yet, uh, equal pay. But since we've had the uh, Harvard uh, and North Carolina decisions by the Supreme Court, there have been, has been an increase of people trying to get rid of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
and many of the initiatives that we take to try to remedy the, uh, the, uh, the inequity that our peoples uh, have faced in the past. Um, and that is not surprising. Uh, the first thing is to understand how we got to where we are. And I'm not gonna give you a whole history of what happened to slavery to whatever, to colonialism to whatever. Uh, maybe you already know that, and if you do, don't, uh, you will. But I am going to say that the fix we're in, I call it, how do we get in the fix we're in? <laughs> the fix we're in, where we make progress, and then every time we make progress, there is opposition and backlash, and we fall back. But when we fall back, we never fall all the way back, you see. And so then we go again, and we continue to struggle. So how did we get in the fix, and what do we do about it? The first thing is capitalism. Capitalism, you have to understand, as an economic system, by definition, requires inequality. I tell students that if you take the first year course in economics, they'll teach you that capitalism requires somebody to be at the bottom. <laughs> now, we may not like that. <laughs> the only question is, who's going to be at the top, who's going to be in the middle, and who's going to be at the bottom? And you can bet that the people who are already at the top don't want to be at the bottom. <laughs> and you can bet that they would do everything they can to see to it that somebody doesn't overcome them and then get to the top. So somebody's got to be on the bottom. Whenever anybody tries to tell you that we can all be lifted up to the same place and we'll all be equal and whatever without us doing anything to make it so, which is what my Martin Luther King used to call getting regulated capitalism <laughs> so that in fact it didn't do this to people, which would not be the pure definition of capitalism then we're gonna see that there's somebody at the bottom, and black and brown people have been consistently at the bottom, with a few making it up to the top. And whenever you think you made it all the way to the top, something will happen if you're foolish enough to think that and that you don't have to worry about any of this anymore. Something will slap you in the face and you will be reminded I remember the story that Ofra told Ofra Winfrey about how she was walking down the Champs Elysees in Paris and went into this expensive store and the people didn't want to serve her. They thought she was just some ordinary black woman who didn't have any money <laughs> and shouldn't be in that store. What she said she learned from that is whenever she went someplace, she would have people, because she got plenty of money to have plenty of people, alert people that she was coming and who she was so that they wouldn't do that stuff to her. And I think of things that, not that I've ever thought that I was anybody, but I think about all the different things like standing on the street under the awning of a fancy apartment house in New Orleans about three months ago because it started to rain down hard and I didn't have an umbrella. So what you do in New Orleans, you know the rain is like in the tropics. It's gonna go away after a while. So I got and stood up under there waiting for the rain to go off. And all these people came in and out of the apartment building and stared at me. Like, what was I doing? They didn't say anything. They just stared at me. I'm trying to keep from getting wet in the rain. Finally, they sent out the black guy who was working with the guy behind the desk to ask me why I was standing in front of their building. <laughs> why? They want to know why you're standing in front of their building. <laughs> I said, how do they know I don't live here? And he started laughing. Uh, I said, I pointed up to the sky where it was still raining. I said, that's why I'm standing <laughs> up under here. But you're suspicious because you're standing up under there. Or being in India with a group of scholars who had invited us, and some of them were Brahmin women who were reformers, because there are always some good people who are with the bad people. <laughs> Uh, and we were traveling around, and we went to a hotel in Delhi, and then went to see the Taj and all that stuff. And I came back early because I had to fly back to the States for something. 
and they didn't want to let me in the hotel. Although I was checked into the hotel, I was staying in the hotel, I had left the hotel that morning, my luggage was in the hotel, and the doorman said, you cannot come in here, go away. I said, I'm trying to go in the hotel, I stay here. And he wouldn't let me in. And finally, one of the Dalits who was sweeping these untouchables, who was sweeping the, the door, in the door, went over and said to the manager that I was staying there. He whispered to him. And then the manager came and told him that he could let me in, that I was not a Dalit, I was an American, I was a foreigner. So when you think you're somebody, <laughs> then there's always somebody to uh, remind you. Now, we spend time in our communities where we work on issues and try to make things better for people. We can try, uh, I was just talking to the gentleman who runs the foundation for this uh, college about the good things that they do for people who are needy and poor and students and how things like that are very, very important. And if we do things like trying to figure out how to resolve the racism uh, conundrum and how to do something to repair the, in the breach, to do something about repairing the injustice of the past, I have concluded now that we spend most of our time working on reasonable solutions. I don't know how many meetings I've been in where people say, well, you know, we have to be reasonable. <laughs> so let us think of something that will be reasonable that those folks that we're trying to get to do something will think they'll agree with us that it's reasonable. <laughs> so we go through all these reasonable iterations, solutions, and we work hard, and we work on that, and we work. What we don't understand is that the people who have the power don't care that our solutions are reasonable. When the Supreme Court decided the Bakke case and said we couldn't have affirmative action, but we could have diversity, which our groups in the civil rights community on the campus thought up. We came up with that as a reasonable solution. Everybody will go for that. The court will give it to us and we won't have affirmative action, but we'll have diversity and nobody will challenge that. So we said diversity and the court said, okay, you can have diversity. And then now people are saying, well, why are they saying we can't have that? <laughs> when in fact we thought that that was reasonable. What is their problem with it? What was wrong, what's wrong with equity? What is wrong with including people? And that is because the people who have the power and the resources and control things aren't interested in our reasonableness. <laughs> they can analyze our reasonableness to be unreasonable ask political scientists. <laughs> they can figure out how what we think is reason. One time I was making a speech in Idaho somewhere to a whole bunch of big university, mostly white students, and white people. I don't know how, what I was doing there, how I got there, but I was there. And I was talking and I was giving this kind of talk about, but not about this part. I was talking about how we at that time were trying to work on reasonable things that people like you will accept. You know, I was doing one of those numbers. And you, we, and it'll help you too. And I was, you know. And it was about education and all the good things that how were people were educated, how great that would be. And a guy raised his hand in the Q&A. One of the guys raised his hand. And I, when I recognized him, he said, I don't understand why you don't understand that we're not interested in what you're saying. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He said, we don't care whether what you're saying is reasonable. We're not interested in the people you're talking about, black and brown people and poor people, getting power. We want our children to keep the power. <laughs> so if we did all those things you're talking about and supported them, they might compete with my children. <laughs> I'm not interested in all that. You do not understand appealing to me on the basis that what you said is reasonable. So what we have to do, and the other thing we do is we don't ask for enough a lot of times. I'll get to that in a minute. But one of the things about reasonableness, my good friend, a woman named Kimberly Crenshaw, who is a professor at UCLA and Columbia, 
and who's a wonderful, smart person, came up with the whole idea of intersectionality that you might have heard of. Uh, and she decided to, my friend Derek Bell, who has passed away, was a professor and was our good friend and taught her, um, and critical race theory and pushing that. And when she first started talking about critical race theory, she was telling me about all that she was going to do, and she'd just done a TED Talk on TV, and she'd done all this, and she was sure that people would appreciate critical race theory because it was so reasonable and so intellectually powerful. I said, people are not, the only people who are going to accept it is, are the people who would have accepted what you said already, whatever you called it. <laughs> These other people aren't interested in it, she said, because they are not going to do what you're talking about. I said, why don't you call it something else? You know, they go, first they're going to make fun of you calling it critical race theory, and they're going to say they don't know what that is, even though they do. And then they're going to use it and your intersectionality to do something really nasty to our folk. Oh, you know, oh, Dr. Berry, you know, I, you just always so pessimistic. I said, I'm not being pessimistic, I'm being realistic. So she went out talking about critical race theory, which she should have done. I said, it's right to do. It's not a question of whether it's right. And if your conscience says it's right, you should do it. But don't expect people to say, oh, we finally got the answer, and to agree with us and to do something about our problems. And of course, that's what happened. What did they do? They started banning books and telling people they can't teach courses and uh, spying on professors and doing all kinds of stuff to people and laughing at the critical race theory. And we are still pushing uh, toward the mark of where we want to go. Uh, so here's what I think. I think that uh, the problem was figuring out then, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do? When we talk about our issues, this is when, as I say, Women's History Month, and if I wanted to, I could go through all the different inequities that women face that have, we've been facing forever. I mean, I could take John F. Kennedy's 1961 uh, commission on the status of women, which Eleanor Roosevelt chaired, and which um, um, was a wonderful uh, report. And it listed all the you know, economic problems, the child care problems. It, it listed every problem that you know. And the hard part is we still have all those problems. That was 50 years ago, wasn't it? 60. 60. And we still got all of these problems now, the same problems. I could look at the Kerner Commission report okay, on race and talk about what happened in Los Angeles and, blah, 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 and how current commissions that we're two separate societies, now we're three or four or five, uh, and how all these problems, and everything that they said was wrong <laughs> then is still wrong, okay? It's enough to make you wake up weeping, you know, like crying out loud in the middle of the night, saying, oh Lord, help me. Um, and I'm not saying, we have allies. We have some folks in the white community who try to do the right thing. They either try to do it because of their values, their religion, because they read something somewhere, or they had some encounter, or they got some reason. There are some people, so I don't just rule out everybody as being complicit, but there are too many people who are. Um, so what do we do, what do we do? Um, I was having a um, conversation with Coretta, uh, Coretta Scott King, one of those many telephone conversations we used to have in all the years after Martin was assassinated and after I became a public figure so people knew who I was and she and I got to be good friends and we used to talk on the phone all the time. And she was going through that terrible period after he was assassinated of being emotion, emotionally pushed from one end to the other and trying to make sure her children were on the straight path and all those things that happened and trying to come to terms with it. But one day I said to her, I was reading something, I'm trying to figure out why Martin talked about voting in 1957 at a, the first coming out party he had in Washington where he got to speak at a big event the older black men 
who controlled civil rights, let him speak for the first time to a big audience after he had done Montgomery and done all those things. And he talked about voting and how things like, if we got the vote, we won't have any problem with judges. We'll have good judges. If we get the vote, we'll have this, that. Everything he said was like, if we got the vote, and then you'd go away thinking, oh, if we just got the vote, man, everything would just be fine. I said, Coretta, why did he say that? I said, Martin had come from Montgomery, where they had sitting in on the buses, and not taking the buses, and all the boycotting and all of that, until they got that uh, court decision, that uh, changed things. Sure, we marched and did all that in the South, and people got killed and went to jail, and oh, it was terrible. And we did get the vote. Yes, that is true. That's later, I said. But he was coming from Montgomery. And he didn't, the vote didn't get us, didn't get us what happened there. She said, oh, Mary Frances, which is what she called me, she said, he was invited and it was his first time and they told him to talk about voting. So that's why he talked about voting <laughs> and said all of that stuff. And she said, at the time, he sort of thought that if we ever got the vote, we wouldn't have to be marching and dying and all of that, going to jail and all of that, boy, all that stuff that we had to do. He thought that at the time. But she said, of course you know he changed his mind. And now, whenever I talk about all these issues I've been telling you about, people say, well, just tell the people to vote, they tell me. When you go out somewhere, tell people that all they got to do is vote. I said, I'm not going to tell people that. <laughs> because I'm not a fool. I said, by the time Martin wrote, where do we go from here, and talked about the fierce urgency of now, he was through with that. Coretta said, when he came to Los Angeles after the Watts riots, and when he went to Chicago after that, and everywhere he went, because he was raising money for the, for the, uh, the movement, you had to go around all these different places, he started telling people about voting because we had had Selma after that and said the guys would laugh at him that he was in LA and he was in some poor neighborhood and was in Chicago and he started talking about the vote. The man says, we vote all the time. In Chicago, they told him the precinct captains come and get us and make us go down and vote. What are you talking about? We've been voting for years. But do you see those roaches and those rats over there in that apartment? And don't you see that there's a, asbestos? And don't you see the way we're living and the jobs and everything that we don't have and the ones that we do have? And you're talking about all we got to do is vote. Get out of here, man. She said they just told him off and ran him up. One died in the street and another. And by the time he came home, he said, I got to stop. There's something more to this. And that's when he went off by himself and wrote that book, uh, Where Do We Go From Here, his last book. And what he said was that, yes, you should vote. People died, went to jail, all kinds of horrible stuff happened and so that we could get the vote, but that what else did you need? Nonviolent direct action, like they had in Montgomery. That's what you needed. You needed that consistently to resist and to press people because politicians would not make change, even promises that they made, <laughs> unless you made them do it. And that's why I wrote History Teaches Us to Resist and talked about how A. Philip Randolph had FDR tell him first man, if you want me to do something about letting your workers work in the government jobs, you have to make me do it, which is why he organized the March on Washington way back then, which didn't have to happen because Eleanor Roosevelt told Franklin to give in because the people were coming and they were gonna swarm all over the mall and everywhere else and that he didn't want that because he was trying to get elected so that what you have to do, and I say nonviolent, because when I was on Trevor, when Trevor was doing, uh, what is that show at night that that other guy is back doing now? Uh, the Daily Show. 
and I was on there with Trevor, and I was talking about this and talking about this very thing. And Trevor said, make sure you say nonviolent. Because if you don't, people say, Mary Frances Bear is going out talking about killing people. <laughs> and that's not what you're talking about. So I'm talking about nonviolent direct action. And after that, um, Piven and Coward, Francis Fox Piven and Cloward wrote a book called Poor People's Movement in which they talked about how people needed to organize themselves and to find direct action tactics to press the people who they wanted to do something. That that's the history. And it wasn't hard to do. What did, what did Frederick Douglass say? People who want freedom without struggle, want crops without plowing the ground. They want rain without any thunder. That's what they want. But you, not, you cannot have social change unless you do something to make it happen. The main thing politicians want is for people, to, I know a lot of them, some of them are my political friends, and some right here from this town of Los Angeles, that they want you to vote for them and people to vote for them, and once they're in office, guess what they want after that? They want you to vote for them again so they can get reelected. The main thing that they want, and they, if you don't ask them for something before they're elected, it's too late for you to go after they're elected and say, you know, I came out and voted for you, and I got all these people to vote for you, so now why don't you give my school so-and-so up? Why don't you help feed the hungry? Or why don't you do this? And it's too late. You have to make them publicly be committed to what you want in the beginning. And we have used nonviolent direct action. That is why Martin organized the Poor People's Campaign and his assassination disrupted the whole thing. That is why we organized the anti-Vietnam War uh, campaign, which I was in at the University of Michigan. And that is why I lied my way into making people think I was a reporter so I could go to Vietnam and see what was going on and go around and see for myself and write dispatches for it. I had such an innocent look on my face that people believed me except the other reporters did, and they said, oh, where were you a reporter? Where are you? I said, don't ask so many questions. People <laughs> know it. Uh, and so we used nonviolent direct action in the Free South Africa movement, which we organized, and which people on college campuses all across this country joined us, and people came to the embassy in Washington and to other places. Maxine Waters ran the, the one we had here in LA all over the place. We had everybody, you know, uh, uh, Michael Jackson, everybody, once we did it, everybody wanted to come. We had so many people wanting to get arrested and wanting to come, we had to like schedule them uh, to come when they wanted. Kamala Harris came, she was a student at Howard and was head of student government and brought all the people. Everybody whose name had been mentioned once in the press came and said, when can I get arrested? You know, I wanna do this cause. And we use that and the vote and pressing members of Congress in their districts, which is why even though Ronald Reagan, your great president from out here in California, who people have forgotten all the bad things he did, anyway, uh, uh, climate change, uh, race, gender, the universities, you name it, I got a whole list. Uh, he said, I stand with the South Africans and their government because communists might get in if we do anything to try to attack apartheid. And so we had to bring him to his knees, which we did. And what he did was he, we had movie stars, people like a guy named Paul Newman who's dead, and y'all don't know who he is. Uh, his wife and all them people. And they brought everybody, they got Harry Belafonte, Harry, our good friend, and had been from civil rights days. All everybody and we got the bill passed in Congress to sanction, because that's what the black folk in South Africa asked us to do, make, stop trading with South Africa. We got it passed, and guess what? Reagan vetoed it and said, it shall not stand. And what did we do? Did we cry and go home and fall out? No, we passed it again <laughs> over his veto. So all I'm going to say to you then is, you have to organize, and you ought to know how to do that here in East uh, 
Los Angeles because you had, somebody told me yesterday something called Mothers of East LA in 1980 that mobilized to stop a prison from being built next to people's housing here in East Los Angeles. And that after that, they stopped, uh, organized and stopped a pipeline. There must be some of her children, their children, the descendants, or they or somebody must be still around. And they used nonviolent direct action to put pressure on politicians in order to do that. And so history teaches us to resist. And what history teaches us that when you resist, we used to use so, uh, uh, mimeograph machines that got ink all over your fingers and put up signs on things. Now you use social media, which makes it easier, right? To organize, get in touch with people, whatever. Get people to show up. Uh, but you can also keep you under surveillance better. See, people forget that. Uh, which is why many movements use, don't use social media, even though it's old fashioned, to get in touch because you don't want to be shut down before you can do what you need to do. But there's something really good about social media because the media, the main media has let us down. There's freedom of the press and all that, but they lie and they don't tell us what's going on. Matter of fact, I would rather depend on what I see with my own eyes in social media than what the media in print and on TV tells me happened. I'd rather see it for myself. Now, all you have to do is to uh, keep on organizing. Keep on organizing. And my book says that it works. That's the purpose of the book, to tell people that it worked. And I wrote it and published it after Trump was elected because all of my friends were crying because Hillary didn't get elected. And I got sick of them laying around crying all the time. I said, can't you do something? <laughs> Besides sitting up talking about telling stories about you know, how sad you feel and whatever, whatever. So they had that big, uh, big uh, march, the Women's March. And uh, the idea was you go out and do something. Um, and uh, also, I don't mean that we shouldn't come up with proposals. If we do, tell people who are our opponents, keep on telling them how it's gonna help them. Let's lie to them, tell them, this is gonna help you if we do so and so, so and see if we can fool them. They, they fool us all the time. Uh, but just keep on organizing and put pressure on and vote, but don't just vote and that's it, and vote because somebody told you a bunch of lies. You should check out what they have to say. And it is indeed true what I always say. Uh, Jimmy Baldwin, well, Jimmy Baldwin used to tell us, he'd come speak to us when I was a student at Howard, you know, the fire next time guy and all of that, and I'm not your Negro. And he spent a lot of time with us, especially us undergraduate philosophy majors. He thought we were the cream of the crop, that we were onto something. I don't know whether we are not, but we pretended we were. But anyway, uh, and he said that somebody's got to go through the fire to make social change. You guys remember that, that somebody has to stand up and also remember that, you know, when you're thinking about what to do and you have a checklist of what to do, and actually it was Martin's checklist and he was repeating it, that if you think about what you want to do, some people will ask, is it popular? If we do that, will the polls show that people will say that was a good thing we did? And if it doesn't, then they don't want to do it. Or some people will say, well, uh, well, is it dangerous? Will something happen to me <laughs> if I do it? And if they think there's any danger at all, they just go home and sit down. Uh, but he said, if your conscience tells you that it's right to do, then you should do it. And so that's what the te uh, mark should be. So just keep on organizing, put on pressure before you vote, after you vote, and also remember that it is true that each generation must make a dent in its all wall of injustice, and that is the way we will someday get liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm glad you stayed away, thank you. <laughs> what are we gonna do now? We're going to have a few questions from the audience, so please be ready with your questions, raise your hand. We have two professors who are going to be walking around 
um, giving you the mic for your questions. So please raise your hand if you have a question. We have someone right here in the front. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you for the speech. It was very motivational. Um, so when you were giving the anecdote about Martin Luther King and you were on the phone with Greta, you as you said that they told Martin Lu that they told Martin Luther King to talk about voting. Who's we? Oh, when I said the men, uh, um, the men who ran, you know, who were the big civil rights leaders. At that time, before Martin Luther King became to, pro to prominence as a young man, remember he was very young as a preacher when they picked him to run the Montgomery boycott, Rosa Parks and all that. Well, he got a lot of press because of that, because it was successful. But the old guys, like A. Philip Randolph, who had organized the mar earlier march with the Brotherhood of Sleep Car Porters, the guy who ran the uh, Urban League, okay, they were the old civil rights cadre of men. And he was just a kid in their minds. But since he had gotten all that press, they told him, we're having a, uh, a, a thing at the mall uh, and we're going to gather people together and we're going to talk about voting because we're trying to get Lyndon John uh, whoever the president, yeah, it was Johnson, Lyndon Johnson to introduce a civil rights bill protecting the right to vote. If you want to come as your first speech in Washington, D.C., before the world, you can come, but you should talk in keeping with the theme of the day. That's what I mean by the guy. And so he was being uh, deferen giving deference to his elders and also understanding that it was their meeting, okay? But I said to Coretta, because I didn't get to say it to Martin because he was dead by then, that he went too far. He should have talked about voting, but he didn't say all that stuff about we're going to get better judges if we just vote and we're going to get this and that and the other. Hey, that's going too far. She agreed with me, and she said when he came home, she told him that. He shouldn't have said all of that, but it was too late then. <clears throat> she was smarter than him, by the way. Not that I'm criticizing Again, uh, it's an honor. Um, can you emphasize on the power of education when it comes to all the concerns and issues that you brought up earlier and how we can you know, be reasonable by being educated? Oh, yeah. Well, I hope we can be reasonable, although sometimes I'm unreasonable uh, when I confront injustice. The most crucial thing that we have been deprived of by those who have the power to ultimately decide what happens in our, for example, in our education system, talking about K through 12, and then the universities and colleges, don't want us, most of them, to have the same kind of education that the best people have. They don't want us, they want us to be able to do certain things, jobs that they think are needed, and that support what they're doing or their families or them, uh, they are not interested in having us educated to be in charge <laughs> and to climb up the ladder of power. Now, they don't mind if a few of us do that because then we become what I call point two people. You know, whenever somebody complains, they say, well, well you know, Juan over there, he's got a good job doing so and so, so and so. What are you complaining about? You know, that's what I mean by point two. They always want to have a few little people around to point to. You know, Selena, she, you know, hey, uh, what about Ofra? She got a lot of money, you know, whatever you people are complaining about. And then you're supposed to slither away and say, well, everything must be all right. I'm embarrassed to be able to say anything. They don't, our schools are not funded equitably in the first place, so we have to put that's one place where we have to put pressure on. And it's a truism among the people in my family and many black folk. My mother used to say to me, you got to get all the education you can get because nobody can take it away from you. See, they can take everything else <laughs> away from you. But, you know, just get all, you know, whatever you get. Always make sure you got more education than anybody you're in the room with, you know. 
like I was supposed to be able to always do that anyway. Uh, so that's why our education does not suit the needs of many of our people. In K through 12, for example, where there's just been a corruption of the system so that when people come to schools like this and education beyond, many of them have not had the kind of education that they should have had before they got here. And the resources aren't available, the teachers aren't available, and there are people who pretend like they love to say to us, and I've been in meetings where they say to us, well, all the stuff you're talking about, you know, supportive, whatever, if people are just smart and work hard, they'll have merit and they'll make it like everybody else. And when I can see before my lying eyes or my truth-telling eyes lies that they're lying to me, <laughs> you see, and I'm supposed to act like I believe them, you see. So the biggest fight, one of the things I hate is when I go places and people complain to me about schools and then they say, I say, have you ever been to a school board meeting? No. Have you ever been to meet with the people who control the money to the schools and put pressure? No. Well, why haven't you been? I don't want to be bothered with those people. They all, you know, they so conservative. and they go, Well, how do you expect to get anything? If you don't, you should send, and I know you have to work hard, but somebody should go to the school board meeting. You don't let those people just have the ground by themselves. Somebody should go to the people who fund the schools at whatever level they are, and in an organized way, demand, because it's not only in your personal interest, it's in the public interest that you do that. You know, and, and so that's what I think. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And education, just like when people say voting is the key, education is not the only key, but it is a major key because sometimes you get it and people won't let you put it into play. But you gotta, it's, we gotta figure out how to better educate us. I was reading a book by somebody who spoke here, um, and I don't know her, a young woman, Bettina. And most of the stuff that she said about how schools should be for children to nurture our children is absolutely correct, but it's not gonna happen. And it's not gonna happen unless you force it to happen. It's not gonna happen because it's good. In fact, because it's good, is the reason why people won't want us to let it happen. <laughs> you see what I mean? So, but they're good things. We come up with good ideas. We have good ideas. We know what works. But it's the organizing. And I don't know. Sometimes people say to me, you ask too much. I mean, just because you want to spend all your time <laughs> for your whole life <laughs> working on this stuff and thinking about it night and day and teaching my students, and some of them have come out and done marvelous things on these issues. I'm so proud of them. Not everybody can do that. That's okay. If you can't, do whatever you can do. I don't know what you can do. Whatever it is, you know, I don't know. But we, that's right. You are right. I'm glad you raised that question. Thank you. Hello, my name is Asha Gary Salas, and I want to say thank you again, Dr. Berry, for being here. And I celebrate you and the voice and the literature that you left behind. I wanted to know, uh, in today's time, that a lot of young people lack tenacity, right? What advice can you give to our student body here on helping build tenacity? Um. Adversity, adversity undermines will, but it also can build will. Um, think about, I don't know if you know what I mean. Uh, I'm not proud of this, but I'll tell you that it's true. Um, my earliest memory is of hearing my brother crying because he was starving. Uh, I didn't know what I was hearing because I was a baby, but I heard the sounds and he didn't starve. He almost did, but he didn't. And later on when we were older, he told me 
yes, he was crying, and he told me why he was crying. It was because my mother couldn't support us anymore, and she had put us in an orphanage. And it was one of those while she went off to try to figure out some way to make some money to come and get us. And it was one of those awful places that you read about awful places where they take, don't take care of kids. And my brother was hungry all the time. All the children were hungry all the time. And they would, if the parent came and brought some money to try to help and left it with the child, and said, you know, my brother was a little older, you can buy something to eat or maybe they'll let you go to the store or whatever. They would take the money. <laughs> and there was a man that was there who was Mr. F.L. who worked there and he would sell bones to the children. He would buy pork chops or something to eat the food and he would give them, sell them the bones if their mother gave them a dime or a quarter or something. It was a terrible, awful, terrible place. And um, after that, my mother came to get us because one of her brothers, she was one of 12 children, everybody was poor. And he let us stay in the house with them, him and his wife, and their five children, and the two of us and my mother, and they had lived in a shotgun house that you could stand in the front and see out the back, three rooms. Uh, and we had sodas for breakfast. Somebody would buy an orange soda. <laughs> I remember that, we called it sodas in Nashville. And we would have that. And for dinner, we would have hot water cornbread and greens with uh, juice with them and drink it. I mean, that's how we live. And I always said, after I started to grow up and my mother finally struggled her way out working for people and went to beauty school and got a beautician's license and started working at a shop and then opened a shop in the basement and got in a little apartment for us to live in. But it took a while, it took a long while. But I used to, I have always complained to my mother that if I had been fed properly, I would be taller and I don't like being short. I used to always say, Mama, I don't like being short. I want to be tall. If I ate, I would be tall. I don't know if I would have been, but I wanted to. But I'm just saying that that kind of adversity you might think that many people who have gone through that kind of adversity aren't resilient, and they've been defeated by it. There are people who've been defeated by drugs. Two of my uh, good friends have a son who was a wonderful kid all the way through high school, or good grades, played soccer, star and everything, and got in with some other folks using drugs and became addicted, and he's still addicted. After high school, he didn't do anything, um, didn't go to college, took the money they gave him and spent it. And now they're in a, um, they've sent him to all kinds of places to get healed and now they're in a facility staying there where the family goes to see if they can try to build him up a little bit and do something. But if, you know, they say that um, suffering builds character. Um, and in some people, suffering does build character. Um, I take it and I tell people, if you suffer, then see it as a way to show that you can overcome it. I had a student in my class two years ago during the pandemic whose mother had cancer and she was having to get infusions all the time and was at home and his brothers and sisters were all essential employees, which meant they were delivering food to people's houses and stuff. They lived in New York City in the Bronx. And uh, they all had to go to work. Um, and he was a student at Penn, smart student. Somebody had funded his education, some philanthropist. And so he was in the class. And he told me, he said, it's tough because I have to stay home with my mother. I have to take care of her. I have to give her the infusions. I have to do all this. And I'm trying to do my classes. And I'm sorry if I'm not always up to date. But I'm trying to be up to date. And we had long discussions during hours over Zoom after his mother was asleep and there were no classes about how he could put his life and keep his life going, keep it together, just to give him some hope. 
And in fact, he made it through that time, through the pandemic. His mother passed away. Um, and he finished school, and he's in graduate school now. He was toughened by the process. I've seen people weakened by the process of travail. But it's testing oneself mentally and psychologically. When I went to Vietnam, I didn't tell anybody I was going. I didn't tell anybody in my family. They would have thought I was crazy in the middle of a war and to lie my way in. But I did because I wanted to see what was going on. And it was, as you can imagine, terrible. I write about it a little bit, and history teaches us to resist. But it was worth it because when I got back, I sent dispatches while I was there. When I got back, I went all around the state of Michigan where I was in school giving talks to people who were in favor of the war about today I was in wherever it was, and here's what I saw in the war, and hoping that what I did. So some people make it and some don't. All you can do is think of it in terms of I'm experiencing adversity and suffering builds character. And think about me, I'm still up here. Look at me, I'm still standing up here, right? I'm not tall yet though. Is that all, is there anything else anybody wants to ask? Yes. Okay. Well, one, one last question. Okay, you decide which, who's that, the, okay. Hello, thank you so much for being here and for all your, your genius and sharing it with us. Um, my name is Martha and I'm a student here at ELAC. I also work with the foundation. I wanted to know what is your point of view and what would you, um, what would you recommend um, to straighten uh, formerly incarceration um, educator, like educating, getting educated after being formerly incarcerated? I, I didn't understand the question. Oh, yes, okay, so how do you feel about the formerly incarcerated students that are now getting educated after going through jail or prison time? Oh, incarcerated uh, students. Uh, yes, the ones that are now out and um, being, coming to college. Uh, I'm a formerly incarcerated scholar myself, so um, I just want to know what you feel about that and how, um, how can we strengthen, like uh, make it more strong to make that movement and to um, continue bringing in more people so that they could get educated and um, be part of you know, the leadership in this country. Well, the only way you can, I, I've been uh, concerned about that issue, uh, and the whole issue of people who are incarcerated because our uh, part of what happens in our criminal justice system is that we lock up our own. James Foreman Jr. has a book about that. He was James Foreman, who was one of our civil rights guys, his son, who was a law professor at Yale and was a lawyer. And James writes about locking up our own, he calls it. He says, in our communities, poor people, when they get a little power, like they're a judge or something, or black people who become judges, and people who are law enforcement people, Latino people who do that and so on, that they are harder on their own people <laughs> than they are on other people. And he calls it locking up our own because they will take juveniles and people who are young, who are not juveniles who are, and give them harsh penalties, put them in jail, not give them a chance to do anything else because they'll say, well, we've got to lock them up so that they will, in fact, uh, not you know, hurt society. They'll become better people when they come out. That is about the most stupid thing I have ever heard uh, in my life. Uh, you know, um, If people are incarcerated, they deserve, if you do the time, you do the crime, you pay the, the cost, you do the time, people deserve to be, in fact, reincorporated. Uh, in society and edu educated. Some states do it better than others, even though I don't know what all the rules are in California, but there are a lot of states where they don't do anything. <laughs> and there are others where they do a lot of stuff for male prisoners, but they don't do anything for women, which I find curious. I don't know what they do here in this state. Now, so my view is that, I mean, if, 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 if Hunter Biden can be a crook, and then go out and make a whole lot of money and be okay and still walk in the streets. What about the rest of us, you know? 
You don't know who Hunter Biden is. Anyway, uh, um, he's the son of Joe Biden, uh, who is an addict and a bunch of other stuff. Anyway, uh, I am very much in favor of that um, and hope that something can be done to strengthen those programs. Okay? Thank you okay. so much.